well here we have uh, a whole like a uh, I guess a uh, machine gunner station. We have a Bren gun here on display, some helmets, grenades, and uh, what is one of those? Field foam. Field foam. Stuff. And back here we have a uh, ration display of you know what uh, soldiers might have ate back then. Original Kit Kat bar, uh, Nestles. Yeah, very interesting uh, stuff we have here. Me and Gabriel here reenacting as the uh, Third Carpathian Rifle Division, um, and this division fought in uh, North Africa and Italy. We're in a it uh, Italy uh, summer uniform, so this would be what soldiers at the Battle of Monte Cassino would have worn. Yeah, so this is our summer uniforms that are made from cotton, so it's breathable and uh, nice compared to thick wool. Uh, winter uh, uniforms, yeah. <laughs> so we are lucky today because we are we we prepared the for the shining, weather. Yeah, so both Chevrolet and Ford built these CMPs and they were built off of um, uh, pre-recs that the British government wanted. So even though they look similar, they all have their own differences. Like you got the engines, you got transmissions, and the front and rear ends are different. But every now and then you'll see a Ford uh, truck with Chevy front end, like Chevy drive shafts because there was time that they were short of drive shafts, so they used uh, Chevy ones. But one thing that is both on, the same on both of them is the brake systems. So this Chevy, when I restored this, you take your brake pads off and it has the Ford script, the F script on them. So it's pretty neat. But yeah, the, the brake systems are identical on both and that's just for safety reasons, but everything else is very similar to body panels and windows and fenders. They're pretty much the same. And um, then there's like, there's a couple variants that Ford made that Chevy didn't, but Chevy made a couple variants that Ford didn't make, but they all had the, uh, the 1500 weight, the 3000 and the 6000 weight. So pretty much that's a three quarter ton, ton and a half and a three ton. And it's the only military vehicle that can carry more than its own weight. Okay. It weighs around 800 pounds and it carries out. Wow. The, um, the castings part of it is like the deck and the housings and that is magnesium. So it's very light. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the early ones that had the Willys four-cylinder engine in it. It was an air-cooled pancake-style engine. And um, they were kind of problematic. so. Any of these that came back in for major repair or rebuild, they converted them over to the military standard two-cylinder engine, which I think is 12 and a half horsepower. And that's what's in it now. So this is the Type 38 Arasaka. This was the standard 
standard issue rifle used by the Imperial Japanese Army from well, basically the end of World War One to World War Two. As, this is an airsoft, as you can see, so not real. These, it would fire a 6.5 millimeter cartridge. It was supposed to be replaced by the Type 99 later in the war, but it didn't. This is your safety, so if it's pointing up, that's safe. If it's pointing a bit to the side, then that is live. Mm -hmm. These are your volley sights, so you can see you would flip these up. You would guesstimate the distance, like, oh, 500 meters or 1.5 kilometers. There you go. And here is your bayonet mount. So you, you would mount this Type 30 bayonet onto the front. Okay. Basically, we have to okay. learn how to write in another language. Um, but a lot of the uniforms are reproduction. Uh, very few guys can actually wear the correct uniforms due to the size of uh, average soldier back in the 40s. Uh, okay. Uniforms nowadays have gone a lot better than when we first started. A lot more uh, reproduction makers are on the market. But we, some items, uh, for example, like canteen haversack, they're genuine. Or the, the putties, the leg wraps, they're genuine. Uh, some of these are very, very available, but on the Japanese uh, second-hand market. So you have to learn another language to yeah. communicate with the seller to buy them. But it's getting easier now because there's more awareness that there's interest outside of Japan. Like uh, our field cap maker, Furuta, he's, uh, he will he will sell to uh, you English speakers. Like, he'll communicate with you in Seoul. He would deal with PayPal. He would. But you didn't have that when uh, we first started. Напоминаю, при команде две шеренги становись. Вперед, шагом, марш. Левый плечо вперед. Прямо. Левый, левый. Раз, два, три.
have you? Yeah, I uh, I started collecting a couple of years ago, um, and my wife actually bought me my my first uh, vintage motorcycle, and uh, so she got me this, and it's a 1978 Can Am uh, Canadian military dispatch bike. Uh, it's 250, and it's based on a hybrid between Can-Am Qualifier and Can-Am TNT. And <clears throat> this one actually belonged to the Canadian Airborne Regiment and had been dropped, had been para-dropped twice. Uh, and I picked it up about, we picked it up about five years ago and restored it to the condition it's in now. And it's actually quite incredible because it's uh, quite an old bike and starts on the first kick every time. I, uh, I went to the Airborne Regiment in 1988, and I stayed there until after disbandment in 1995, and uh, <clears throat> was in three commando uh, in Airborne Regiment, <clears throat> and may have actually ridden this bike at one point in time or another, so uh, yeah, it does hold quite a little bit of nostalgia for me. But we used to use them for reconnaissance as well, so <clears throat> uh, they were quite nimble. Um, to get around in the, in the summer. So, yeah, I did a bit of reconnaissance work on it, but uh, not really into the dispatch side. And ha have the motorcycles always been a part of OMVA? No, it's only recently. Um, as far as I know, because I've only been a member for about five years. Um, before that, there were a couple of um, exhibitors who had World War II era motorcycles and a Korean uh, era motorcycle. Um, but I try to keep it to... Uh, my generation and um, and typically all Canadian bikes. I have two more that are under restorations right now and two more that I'm looking at purchasing. So uh, I will have quite a collection of ones. Our group is a Soviet reenactment group. We uh, are one of the biggest ones in Canada, if not the only one in Canada. Uh, and we have about 30 people. We do all sorts of events from museums to private events. Uh, we also look for medals that used to belong to veterans and we uh, do our best to return them to the actual recipients or the families of the recipients of the medals. So uh, I want people to know that us as a unit, we don't only do reenacting, we also try to preserve the history in the form of honoring the actual veterans, the actual rewards, and uh, we try to record as much history as we can uh, about the weaponry, about the equipment. So uh, it's not just about going to museums, it's also about teaching people. I think uh, our unit should be known for its educational value as well to the public. Uh, not a typical rifle, uh, the most commonly one was the Mosin, but this here, it's an SVT-40. Uh, initially uh, developed in 1938, the SVT-38. It was later modernized in 1940 uh, into the SVT-40. So about two million were made, maybe un uh, maybe less. And uh, the difference is it's semi-automatic. uses the same cartridge as the Mosin. However, uh, the semi-automatic fire mode allows for a faster rate of fire, more effective on the battlefield. There are a few issues with it though. The biggest one is the uh, increase in moving parts. It has so many more parts, makes the design more complicated. Its accuracy was also uh, inferior to the Mosin, so as a sniper role it wasn't as effective. Nonetheless, it was issued to more experienced soldiers and whoever knew how to use it well put it to good use. In terms of getting a hold of the uniforms, uh, we have a reenactment store uh, in Belarus called Schuster's. They make very good uh, reenactment clothing for both the German army, for the Soviet, for the Russian uh, White Army. Um, we get all of our stuff mostly from them, so this uniform you see on me, this uh, pilotka, um, everything on me is from Schuster's. It's a store in Belarus, we ship, uh, we get the items shipped over here. We have members who are Belarusian, so they go to Belarus, they pick up some items up and they give it to us. So we have a little bit of a perk there. But a lot of German reenactors, they use the same um, uh, reenactment store as well for their clothing. We represent uh, infantry uh, unit, when the 191st Rifle Division. Uh, so we are uh, an infantry uh, division that uh, not really any special forces. However, within every division, there were special types of soldiers. We do have a recon uh, scout impressions that you'll see shortly. In the battle, you'll see them as well. 
Uh, it consists of camouflage clothing. Mm -hmm. So we do have uh, recon, scouts, special forces, but what we represent today is your general uh, standard rifle. Two badges on me. Uh, let's talk about the metal. So the metal, it's not a real metal. As a unit, we don't like to put on actual uh, medals that people fought and bled for to earn. What we did was we created a um, medal that commemorates the division we represent, the 191st Rifle Division. This is a medal we give to family members of that division. Uh, we give to the reenactors of our unit this medal after one year of being with the unit. It's a way to uh, symbolize our appreciation for the unit, for the actual unit. So this is not a real medal, it's one we designed ourselves and that we give to the relatives of the actual people who fought in this division. But uh, again, back to the medal, not real. Uh, this is just what we designed to uh, remember and commemorate uh, the actual people who earned the real medals. Basically, I'm just uh, doing repairs on a pair of uh, pants for one of the troops. Um, this is like a company level repair shop. So we've got a tailor and a shoester. Um, we've got somebody to work on boots. I'm working on uh, doing sewing repairs uh, to various items of uniforms and clothing. Uh, yeah, well, this is definitely a German sewing machine uh, from the period. Um, I want to say this one's like roughly late 30s. So this is very similar to the machines they would have used. Excellent. Um, the German army also had Singer sewing machines too. They just used whatever they could source. So yeah, hand powered. Uh, this is exactly the kind of machine. This one's a hand crank, but uh, very much the sewing machines that they had available to them. Well, the individual soldiers would have done a lot of their own basic repairs, but plus they were issued sewing kits for that, you know, basic rice and stuff like that. But for the more extensive stuff, uh, they would bring it to us to, to repair. So, yeah. Kill it just in case I can't get it going again. 